So it's a great pleasure and an honor to have Professor Marino Serial today with us at the CASUS annual workshop. He's uh, one of the co-founders and also director of the Max Planck Institute um, uh, for molecular uh, uh, genetics here at here in Dresden. And uh, he's one of the leading experts uh, in systems biology and especially with a, with a strong focus on um, the molecular mechanisms where cells bring in things from the outside to the inside of the cell. And this is one of the fundamental processes within cell, cell drinking, cell eating, that's where it comes from. And he has provided some of the textbook knowledge on these things. After graduating in biology at University of Trieste, um, he conducted postdoctoral studies at the Institute Jacques Monod in, uh, in Paris and the EMBL in Heidelberg. He then became group leader at EMBL and afterwards Max Planck director, as well as, as I said, the co-founder of the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics. Entries. He's also an honorary professor at the Medical Faculty of Technical University, Dresden. Um, one of the key things is here that uh, today I think we hear something on how to really go from the molecular level to the full tissue level, level of, a, of a liver. And I'm very much looking forward to this. And I'm very happy to have him here today. Uh, Marino has uh, 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 been awarded several prizes, the FEBS Anniversary Prize, the Chiara Delopio Prize, and the prestigious Leibniz Prize as well. So I'm very looking forward to his talk and I'm very happy that he could join today. And the stage is now all yours. Thank you very much, Michel. Um, I'm really, thank you very much for your kind introduction. So can I share the screen now? Perfect. We can see your screen now. Oh, for, exactly. Okay, very good. And we can see the presentation. Okay. Everything's working perfectly. Perfect. Okay, now you can even have the laser. Wonderful. Everything okay, works. So thank you very much again for the invitation. It's really, I'm delighted to be with you, um, at least uh, virtually on, on, on computer. So as this is symposium is focused on digital twins, and this is a means of getting replicas, digital replicas of living system. Uh, I thought to present our work on the digital model of liver tissue to explain to you how we view really computational methods as essential for understanding uh, not just accumulation of data and analysis of data, but also how we can use them in medicine. And I think this will be very much, I would say, in the interest of digital health and systems biology, uh, which are two topics of casus. And hopefully I will be sufficiently, uh, let's say, clear and simple to make sure that also that I don't lose the colleagues on autonomous vehicles, earth systems, uh, science and, and matter under extreme conditions. So I, I, I'll try to be as simple as I can. So the, first of all, let me uh, emphasize to you the fact that um, we are using this digital reconstruction, which I will present to you and also as a means also of developing models that can des describe tissue structure and function, and of course, have a relevance to pathological mechanism. So what I'm going to tell you today is that first of all, I will introduce the liver, liver tissue structure and function, and some relevance, of course, to pathology in the course of this presentation. I will show you how we reconstruct liver tissue from high resolution imaging, which is very different from what is done today in histology. I will then guide you through our mechanistic model of bile flow, which is based on these uh, digital images. And then I would like to tell you really how we can infer information which is relevant to understand disease mechanism, uh, not really to, uh, if you wish, so much diagnostic, although there are diagnostic parameters you will see, but also about how we can get insight into uh, pathogenetic mechanisms by applying the bile flow model. 
So first of all, I, I would say that um, I'd like to introduce the liver as an organ that I think uh, you probably are not too familiar with, but it's very important for you. Of course, there are more uh, exciting organs like the brain or other, but uh, the liver actually is very, very important. The reason why you can, you can drink and uh, you can have a good time to party is that your liver will uh, detoxify everything which is toxic to your body and will include the alcohol. So uh, these are a number of things that uh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, as you can see, these are all the things I actually eat very much, um, uh, very, very much like olive oil as I'm Italian and uh, a number of things. But these are also things that I like very much and is actually not very good for the liver. So uh, I, this is just to say that if one uh, abuses or one has other disorders, then one is incapable of dealing with this continuous toxic effect that the liver has to be subjected to. So therefore, this is enough to say about the importance of liver as an organ. Now, um, let me guide you towards understanding the structure of liver. Now, the liver is divided into units, which are called lobules. The lobule is sort of a simple organizational unit, and then many of these lobules make basically this organ that you see here. This is a lobule. So in essence, what you have to think about this, and I want to make it complicated, I try to make it as simple as I can, is that this is a two pipes circulation system. One pipe brings blood. Blood that brings substances that you have ingested in your intestine, your gastric system, and brings them via the portal vein here at the edge of this lobule into the uh, uh, a capillary system that uh, uh, basically brings all the blood substances close to the cells of the liver that have to do the metabolic work before exiting via the central vein. It's actually important that you remember for the rest of the talk, the blood goes in via the portal vein and exit via the central vein here. Now the hepatocytes have to do one thing. They have of course to receive the substances that are coming from the blood and they have to uh, metabolize them, detoxify it, and secrete them. And what they do, they secrete bile so all the bile salts, which are used for digestion, for example, but also the molecules that have to be expelled back to the intestine, they secre secrete via this uh, small network of uh, what they are called bicanalicolide. I will explain you what they are. They're little pipe system that send them back out of the lobule into the bile duct so that this goes into the gastrointestinal tract. So therefore you have a, Blood comes in, a bile comes out. And what is important, you retail, portal vein is the entry. Blood goes in this direction from the portal vein to the central vein. Bile is produced and flows in the opposite direction from the central vein direction into the bile duct, which then takes the bile into the gallbladder and then will go into the intestine. I hope it's clear. So retain it therefore that this is a two pipe system. And these two pipes are not crossing, they are, uh, 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 they are complementary. So now what we wanted to do was to uh, develop on the basis of um, experiment and uh, combining experiments and theory, a, a, three, a, a, three, a 3D multi-scale model of bile flow. So the cartoon that I show you that describes really how the liver is organized. Now we wanted to create data and show really how exactly these pipes are organized in the liver tissue. So by imaging, by looking at the images, by incorporating image analysis, by describing 3D tissue reconstruction. So producing a digital model of the liver. And then this digital model will give us a quantification of the bile canalicular network geometry. So 
So the pipe where the bile is flowing. On the other hand, by, we can also apply microscopy techniques in order to measure bile transport in the living animal. We cannot do this in the, live, in the living human because the level of resolution that we are working is very, very high. You will have to put a microscope on the liver in the operation room, which is at the moment just not feasible. But what we can do, we can apply this to animal models such as mouse and then measure uh, bile transport in the living animal. We can apply again image analysis and produce a data that quantify bile transport in this system. And then what we can do, we can combine the two models to produce a predictive 3D multiscale model of bilirubin fluid dynamics. And as you will see, in fact, as you can already see, we use a chain of models um, uh, that put complexity depends on the scale at which we are working at the cellular scale or even subcellular scale or at the, at the tissue scale. And therefore, um, uh, uh, from this model, we can produce then um, uh, perturbation, for example, to validate the model. Here, I'm not going to show you this, but it's interesting, in fact, to think that the model that we produce can also be tested experimentally and some aspect of that really can be validated. Now, you probably know from the, your, your maybe um, um, school time, high school time, that uh, histology is the gold standard of pathological uh, analysis today. So here I'm going to show, uh, I'm showing you various histological uh, pictures that show that actually the liver uh, can be affected very severely by disease. And one, this is the case, for example, very obvious. This, these are fat droplets. These are lipid droplets which accumulate in the tissue, which are not problematic simply because they accumulate fat, but as you will see, they affect the liver structure. And you can go for various type of diseases. When you have steatosis, you have the accumulation of fat, you start having other type of repair mechanisms that go wrong in the tissue and the organ progressively really loses its function. Now, we have to know that there are disadvantages with classical histology. So it is, uh, most of the time, it has really been considered to be subjective. Traditionally, it is non or semi-quantitative. Today, there are better models really to quantify histological uh, sample, although still the pathologists, they really look at and, and they define a, a disease that really by sub subjectively by eye. It lacks, especially, this is very important, it lacks 3D information. That will, this is so important for the liver because the network of pipes is a three-dimensional network, so both the one that brings blood and the one that transports pile. And therefore, and the other thing which you have to understand, the transition from 2D to 3D is very difficult. It's very, very hard to understand really when you look at the section in a tissue, exactly how it corresponds to the 3D organization of the whole tissue. So some structures are not recognizable because of the lack of resolution. For example, the bicanalicore here are very, very hard to see like this. So we develop really a pipeline for tissue level reconstruction, which is really adopting the best technology that we have today in light microscopy. You still have to have a resolution below the micron. And therefore the best techniques are still unfortunately the one uh, based on light microscopy. I say unfortunately, because ideally you would like to uh, use this system also for uh, imaging uh, human, li human liver in, in a living person, in a li not just in a, in a biopsy. So basically all we do, we uh, image at low level of reconstruction. Then I'm going to show you this. We then go zooming into a small part of this tissue and image a high level of resolution. Here, it's very, very laborious because you have to create really a, 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 an imaging of the tissue, which is as much as possible three dimensional. Here we talk about the maximum we could do is a cubic millimeter of tissue uh, due to a very special microscope, but otherwise a cube of 100 micron is really uh, uh, means a lot of effort to do that. And then you can get really uh, uh, even subcellular level or reconstruction. This is a single cell 
which has uh, uh, in co color code the apical and basal surfaces. I think what you have to do just to, to know that we can basically have a multi-scale type of imaging for this. I'm going to show the reconstruction of this. So the structure that I show you before in the cartoon, now I'm going to show them to you as they are in the real organism. In this case, it's a mouse liver. So here you see, this is the central vein. That's where the, this is the portal vein. That's where the, when the bile blood comes in and the central vein is when it gets out. This is the sinusoidal network. This is the capillary system that brings blood in. This is, as you can see, digitalized. And now this is the bicanalicro network. So these are the nuclei of the cells. And uh, this is the cell reconstruction, how they make this tissue. So basically what we have here is that now uh, we have turned these images into a 3D reconstruction of a piece of liver tissue with, uh, with the interest um, of that we have here in understanding how uh, actually the, not just the liver is structured, but how, so how it is functional. So now what I'm showing you here is again, a picture of the a true tissue, not the cartoon. This is the portal vein where blood comes in. This is a central vein when blood comes out. In magenta is all the capillary system that uh, uh, where the blood is to traverse to to distribute the substances to the cells of the, of the liver, the major cell which do the metabolic work, which are the pathocytes. In green is the bile canalicular network. Now, just to explain to you what peculiarity of this hepatocyte is that one hepatocyte has one surface that faces another hepatocyte and the two together form this little tubing, which you see in green here, where the bile is secreted. And this hepatocytes here with a bicanaliculi form here is a pipe of about one micron in diameter. It's very, very small. And they are sandwiched, so to speak, between the cells that form the blood capillary system. This is why you see that the green and the magenta are complementary. They are, of course, not superimposed, but that means there is a lot of network of pipes in a cubic millimeter of tissue. And I'll give you the number in this. This is just illustrating therefore that there is a tremendous amount of surface which has to make the system very efficient because blood has to go through the liver which acts like a filter and all the substances which are toxic has to be taken by the hepatocyte and processed. Otherwise, anything that will escape or will go to our brain really would make us, for example, to collapse. So therefore this system is very, very efficient and is formed by this three-dimensional, extremely ramified and complete network of bicanaliculi and capillaries. Just to give you an idea, this is the bicanalicular network. These are all the surfaces of the hepatocytes, of these cells that form this pipe system. And you can see every one of these little corner is connected. So all hepatocytes are somehow by one part or another communicated with the rest of hepatocytes in the, in the tissue. The total length of this bicanalicula is about 5.8 meter per cubic millimeter. This is quite a lot, as you can see. And the connectivity is 100%. So this tells you, in fact, that this system is extremely efficient in distribution in distributing substances, which will be not just going into the pathocyte, but also will be secreted by the pathocyte so that they can go into the intestine. Okay, let me just go back to our strategy. Now, I told you that what we can do, we can image the liver tissue at high resolution. We can do image analysis and reconstruct in 3D the tissue. And we can give you, and this I gave you one example only, quantification of the bicanalicular network geometry so that we can have all parameters, we can extract them from this, um, from this uh, um, uh, digital representation of the tissue. Now, what we can also do is now we can take the animal and measure bile transport in the living animal. I'm going to show you an example of that. 
And we can apply again another type of image analysis in order to uh, have a quantification of vial transport. And this is, as I said, is a prerequisite in order to create a more general model of bile flow in the 3D in the liver tissue. So therefore, let me tell you how we now measure not just bile canal coli, the structure that form the liver, but also bile flow into this, uh, 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 into this tissue. So we use a fluorescent molecule. So as I said, this has to be done under the, a confocal microscope, is actually a, a, a two-photon microscope. So what we can advantage, we can advantage of a molecule, which is called the 6-carboxyfluorescein diacetate, CFDA, which is transported, you can inject it in the blood, and is transported by the blood, blood towards the hepatocyte in the liver by the network that I showed you before, the capillary network. Now it is taken in uh, into the hepatocyte and then there are enzyme diesterases that hydrolyze this molecule and convert it into 6-carboxyfluorescein, which is now fluorescent. Therefore, what you are going to see in a moment, you're going to see the molecule that will go into the system and then will become fluorescent in the hepatocyte, the, as I said, the major metabolic cell of the liver. Then you will see that this molecule will be secreted because they are transporters. It's basically behaving like a bile salt. It's transported into the, by this transporter into the bile canal coli and then it will flow into this network of bicanal coli that I've shown you before in the fixed tissue. Instead, you will see it now in the living tissue. So let me play the video for you. So here you can see this, I'll play it again, this increase in fluorescence, green, where all the cells get green and then the apical uh, surface, this bicanal E. coli are uh, becoming green by the tracer. And in magenta, you see blood, the blood that flow into the capillary system, which is called sinusoids in the liver. So these videos allow us therefore to have a measurement of how bile is transported in the bile canal e. coli system and flows out of the liver tissue. This is the method that we, that we are using. You have to consider that these images are very small in terms of volume of tissue, but they are very big in, ter in terms of uh, storage in memory. For example, there are very, many of them are really terabytes of, of memory. They are really incredibly big. So the other problem that you have to consider is that, as I told you, the diameter of these little pipes is one micron. Here we are looking at them in the animal, which is being operated and put under a microscope. And that's something which you have to think really is very, very difficult to do because imagine just looking in an animal uh, that breathes, um, uh, you will have a lot of uh, uh, motion artifacts caused by respiration and cardiac activity as you're looking at something which is very, very small. Therefore, we have to apply correction systems uh, for, for motion artifacts, which are shown here. This is the original image, and we have to make it really to be more stable by having these corrections. And this is basically what you see. You have the maximum projection one versus the other. You see that with this correction, you basically get the images um, more, uh, uh, a little bit sharper. It's not perfect, but actually these are system which helps to, uh, to um, to, to make the data really more um, reliable and, and therefore quantifiable. Okay, so the next problem is that we have this, we can measure this, but we have to quantify this. Measuring, visualizing is not sufficient for this. So what we do is that um, we have to determine the, 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 the uh, flow of the bile. And what we do is that we divide in the, uh, in the quantification this uh, uh, distance from portal vein to central vein uh, into three zones. So refer therefore to the central vein zone, to the middle zone, 
into the portal zone. So this is helping you, uh, this is helping us in the quantification because things are different. Of course, we are operationally divided into three zones. We could look really at every cell layer into this three, into this different uh, from the distance from central vein to portal vein. But by doing a, this, this, uh, this division, it's already helping to simplify the system, but yet maintain a sense of spatial organization in the tissue. So, uh, uh, so these uh, three zones are therefore divided. And therefore the, the geometric model that I told you before was used to deduce the velocity of bile over these three zones that I told you before. And uh, here you can see the comparison of, inter of the intercellular fluorescence intensity along this uh, central to portal vein axis shows that the, 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 the here shows that the, uh, uh, the, the bile um, uh, is, is getting in, in, uh, first really is getting into the cytoplasm in the central vein, that's where the peak occurs, but rapidly goes down. And you see instead the portal vein, uh, the portal uh, vein zone and the middle zone are uh, occurring later. And then the Balkan liquor, you see also there, uh, the uh, intensity of this tracer goes up, but then immediately down in the central zone. And then uh, you see it accumulating a little bit later in the middle zone and in the central and in the portal vein zone. So here you see therefore changes in velocity of bile over the tree zone. Um, so this actually results are expected. It shows you basically that um, uh, uh, there is a certain direction of bile flow. Uh, the, the tracer was secreted in clear fa faster in the central vein and uh, faster than the portal vein zone. So basically it goes in the central vein and then uh, goes more to the uh, portal vein zone. And this is exactly consistent with the fact that you have flow of bile from the central vein to the portal vein. So now that we have this quantification of transport, what we can do is then attempt to combine the two to, to to simulate this fluid, uh, biliary fluid dynamics by integrating, number one, the structural and functional properties of the bicanalicular network at, in this multi-scale from the digital model and from the model I showed before. And we can integrate it with the subcellular parameter of bile transport that I measured really by microscopy in the living animal. And we could combine them with a mathematical modeling of the fluorescent bile tracer uh, in order to make really this predictive 3D multi-scale model of billiard uh, of our bulk flow. So here I'm showing you what Yanis Kalaizidis has done really is that, uh, so um, we basically describe the tracer kinetics that I show you measure really by microscopy in a mathematical model, which is formulated a set of, of ordinary differential equations to estimate basically bile transport rates. So the model distinguishes again the three zones, central vein zone, middle zone, and portal vein zone. And, uh, 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 and so basically the, within each zone, we know that the CFDA, the tracer is transporter, is transported sequentially from the blood into the cytoplasm. There, it is cleaved and becomes fluorescent, becomes this uh, CF becomes fluorescent. And then it is secreted into the bicanalicula. Of course, all the three zones are doing this simultaneously. So we are just dividing it operationally, but we are considering in the model that all this is occurring in the three zone as done together. Um, so, uh, the model is also, I should say, is based on Michaelis Menten uh, uh, kinetic, um, uh, enzymatic kinetics, because we have to consider that the, that the CFDA is converted into the fluorescent tracer and secreted into the bicanalicoride by basically enzymatic reaction. These are esterases, these are enzyme or transporters. Finally, the, uh, the, uh, the 
CF, the, the tracer fluorescent, exit now the network into the bicanal liquor and exit and goes out of the liver into the bile duct. So that the, um, uh, we, uh, so that it can really be secreted out of the, of the liver. So since we consider the uh, spatial parameter, we could infer that the bile velocity uh, within the bicanal liquor in fit increases progressively from the central vein to the portal vein. And I'm, 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 I'm going to show actually the next step of the model, which is really uh, in order to obtain a more accurate estimate of bile flow, we had to consider the geometry of the bicanal liquor and the ultrastructural level. Because in fact, these bicanal liquor are not just tubings, they are not pipes as a, like an engineer pipe. They are more convoluted. There is in fact a lot of structure inside. You have to think really at the microscopic, le microscopic level, these lumina are similar like the intestine that we have when you have a lot of folds and a lot of villi. In this case, they have microvilli that makes really that the lumen is not just empty, but is crowded with structures. And they're actually even more complex structures that I don't have the time to say. Therefore, this geometry of the lumen would not allow you to have just a normal pipe uh, completely free of, of content, but therefore will encounter, will provide really a slowdown on the, on the uh, flow for the, for the pipe. So as the bile is an incompre incompressible Newtonic fluid with a viscosity which is similar to that of water, uh, the flow can be considered laminar. And from the simulation that we have of bile flow in the reconstructed bicanal coli, we deduce that as the flow is lower, a, a drowsy diameter of the bicanal liquor, which is smaller than the real diameter. So this gives us basically a correction factor because otherwise if this was completely open, you will have a faster flow. But because it is closer, we can consider that this, the hydrodynamic will give you a, a sort of a factor of correction. Um, now, that means also that a segment of the bile canal liquor right here was therefore modeled as a tube with distributed sources, you can see, of fluid along the entire surface, as you can see here, leading to this osmotic influx. Because the problem is that you have to consider that every bile salt or everything that is secreted in there will call water. In fact, there are pumps for water they broke in the tissue. That's what I told you before. The bile is actually a very, as a, 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 a consistency similar to water. So therefore we had to take into account that uh, uh, factors like the concentration of osmolites in the lumen, the osmotic pressure as a consequence of the presence of these osmolites, the flux that would derive out of that and the velocity in the, um, uh, in the direction from the central vein to the portal vein. And by integrating this model to the previous model that I told you of bile flux and the 3D geometry of the bike and electron network, we, dist we infer the distribution of bile velocity and bile pressure in the tile lobby. As you can see, uh, the velocity of now, I just uh, point on the velocity of uh, bile goes from the central vein increases as you go really towards the portal vein. This is really what was predicted before, but also what you can see more accurately predicted here. So that shows us as bile is secreted, it accelerates progressively as it flows from the central vein towards the portal vein before it, got, it gets out of the, of the, uh, of the bile duct. <coughs> okay, so finally, now we can obtain a full lobule distribution of bile velocity and pressure which is, uh, 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 which as you can see, cannot be obtained, uh, cannot be measured experimentally because it will be impossible today to measure with any technical means that we have to bile flow in such a small amount of pipes in the tissue here. And here is the model which has been created by Georgios Burantas in Ivo's Balzarini lab. So we cannot consider the complexity of the bicanal recurrent network at the subcellular level. Here we have therefore to have some simplification. Therefore, we have to approximate the bicanal recurrent network as an anisotropic porous medium. 
uh, with parameters such as defective tissue porosity and permeability, which are tuned according to the results of the previous model that I showed before, which were produced at the scale of more of cellular level. And um, uh, the, the bile velocity, as you can see here, increases gradually from the central vein, as I told you before, and along the midi zone, the medial zone, until it rapidly accelerates here at the portal vein, where the exit of the to the bile duct is. Um, and, and here it will go up to a maximum of 12 micron per second which is uh, the maximum speed we, can, uh, we could estimate. Conversely, there is an opposite gradient of bile pressure. The bile pressure decreases 30 fold from the central vein to the portal vein area and drops almost to, to, to uh, very fast near the bile duct, which are at the, at the, ex, at the uh, vertexes of this exocom. So the maximum bile pressure was predicted to reach about 2,500 Pascal in the central vein area here. And, uh, uh, and the value, which is consistent actually with what has been reported uh, uh, before in, in, in measurement in rats. And, and uh, so basically altogether, you can see there are these two opposite gradients of bile velocity and bile pressure that um, uh, tells you that in fact, these are, uh, uh, there are different orders of magnitude between the central vein and the portal vein that characterize basically the hydrodynamics of this, of this system. Now, these results are important because liver diseases are characterized in fact by disruption of bile flow and alterations in bile pressure, as I will show you in a minute. But now we have a model to be able to clarify that. So let me go back to the problem of now looking at disease liver, at the pathology of the liver. The, um, here, the liver uh, in, the, um, in, in liver tissue where you have an accumulation of fat that gives you steatosis and even a, a, a severe, more severe steatohepatitis, you have a progressive accumulation of lipid droplets, but you will see that if you look really at the liver tissue, with the detail that we are able to look in the mouse tissue. Now, if you look in the human liver tissue, you will find there will be a number of things which have never been described before. And that's what I'm going to share them with you. This is a collaboration with the clinicians, the group of Jochen Hampe, uh, Clement Schaff, uh, Schaffmeyer. So now I'm going to show you the reconstruction of now human liver tissue by looking at the same thing I showed you before with the mouse tissue. That is, we are going to look at sinusoidal network, bile canalicular network. We are not going to see bile flow because as I said, we cannot measure bile flow, but we can infer from the digital model of human liver tissue implications of bile flow. So these are really the, uh, the bile canalicular network between healthy liver and here a diseased liver. And you see already that there are changes in the network. There are changes in the lipid droplet. Of course, the disease liver is full of lipid droplets and that these lipid droplets are really very, very big, can very big. They cause the pathocyte to balloon. That's something which is, is not just eating fat, it's just that there is a progressive accumulation of fat into lipid droplet that deform the cells and the tissue. What I show you here is that a, a, a reconstruction that we have done from the human liver, either normal control, healthy obese, steatosis, and early NASH. Uh, uh, these are non-alcoholic patients. This is really something, this is, a, this is a metabolic disease. And you see here that when you look in comparing control with, for example, NASH, the more severe disease, it's actually, this is even not the more severe stage of the disease. This is the beginning of the, of the more severe stage. You find immediately that whereas, as I told you before, the Balkan and Ikran network is completely connected, three-dimensional. Here you find holes in the network. You find discontinuities in the network. And these discontinuities of network, in fact, predicts that there are consequences in cholestasis or problem in bile flow in the tissue. This is the, um, the uh, reconstruction that we have, the digital model again, 
of this different liver tissue. This is again liver tissue from human patients. And here you find, in fact, this reconstruction. You have the Balkan alicola network here, and you see the holes. You see that whereas normally this is very well connected, here you have some holes. In fact, you have some holes here because there are some hepatocytes which are very big. They have this ballooning of lipid droplets. And then now they lose the apical surfaces and the apical surface cannot form by canaliconite and therefore you have holes in the network. You see these holes very well when you look at this, uh, as I said, this uh, very fine network and you see the holes them instead in the disease condition and you can quantify them, of course. You quantify them, for example, the radius of this, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, increases as it uh, is with another, again, um, another sign of the pathology here, as you go from the, uh, uh, from the center of the portal vein again, and you see here this, uh, the connectivity of the network here, you can see is disturbed. Okay, so now we can, uh, the observed alteration that we are seeing of the bicanalicola network architecture, they have, they must have consequence for liver function, tissue function, and particularly for blood flow, because not only do we have uh, uh, simply this, 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 uh, this continuity that they form, but that means that this continuity will really mean also that flow of the bile is going to be perturbed. Now, it's not possible to measure bile flow in the bicanal liquor of human liver, as we did in the mouse liver. And therefore, we could extend, and this is again work by Lutz Bruch and uh, 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 Michael Kuchen from the TUD here, we could um, um, extend our bile flow model in a spatially heterogeneous fashion to handle this extreme inhomogeneity of bicanal coli in the disease tissue. And here you see really that uh, there is, a, uh, in this case, you have pressure in the healthy obese, I'm just comparing for you your clarity, healthy obese and steatosis here. And you can see immediately this is pressure in different tissues of different patients. These are, these colors is just showing you different patients. And um, so the, the predicted pressure in the pericentral area is very different. And you see in fact immediately that in the case of this patient, you see that there is a massive increase in the, in the pressure uh, that reaches uh, in, in two patients, we predicted them from the model to reach about something like 4,000 Pascal, which is really very, very high. So therefore, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this model, in fact, predicts this increase in pericentral bile pressure in steatosis and also in NASH. And, um, and this, of course, uh, a different level of severity, as you can see here, depending on the Balkanal liquorite geometry and topology between these different patients. So just to conclude what I told you, which I hope was clear, um, we have done a topological characterization of the Balkanal liquorite, and I haven't shown you the capillary system, the sinusoidal network, uh, extracted from this digital model, of uh, uh, liver tissue, digitalized. We have specially dis distributed morphological alterations. And I just presented to you the Balkan liquor that actually changes in other parameters. We are getting, as we use more marker, we learn more and more about the distortions which are in the liver tissue, which of course reflect the pathology that the, that the uh, patients really are affected by. And this therefore can be used as tissue biomarkers to actually resolve liver disease at different stages. We can see, we can easily distinguish from this analysis patients that are sort of almost normal, healthy obese from patients that uh, decline into more uh, severe cases, uh, severe degrees of the, of, the, of the disease. And now the geometrical model of liver tissue in conjunction with a mechanistic model of bile flux provide the means to deduce parameters of the system that in this case simply cannot measure the experimental, which I find is very interesting because it means that by studying also, by applying this kind of approach, even to fixed tissue, 
tissue which you can get really from biopsies, even if we cannot go into the operation room and measure these, of course, in the human patients with today's technology, that's not possible. But even that we can learn from this uh, some features predicting parameters such as bile flow, not only digital space parameter, but also functional parameters such as bile flow that otherwise could not be measured in, in any other system. And therefore use these approaches then to learn something about the mechanism that underlies really the disease progression in the patients. So finally, I just uh, mentioned the collaborators that I have. And of course, Ivo uh, remembers probably the, the time when we did this work together. It's exciting time. I think we have new, new things coming up, which will be equally exciting or even more concerning this, um, this approach to understand really to use this uh, digitalization of tissue, reconstruction of tissue to learn really from, uh, from tissue structure and function. So this is my student, Kirsten Meyer, they did the work, Hernan Morales Navarrete and Yanis Karaiziti, they really did a lot of this uh, software for uh, reconstructing uh, mouse tissue. Fabian was the one that did the analysis on, uh, on human uh, liver and Sarah was the technician that helped us. And thank you for your attention. Happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Marino Serial. Um, was a great talk. And uh, Michael, please. Oh yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Marino. This was this was amazing, especially seeing that you can already uh, uh, create a. 3D model that actually predicts the flow within the network, uh, uh, showing this as a as a bulk model. So um, I, I was I was wondering since you have the the basically the connectome of the of the whole network, can you also apply statistical methods on the network that give you some information on the flow, uh, or do you really think? going towards a full simulation, maybe at one in, in five years of the full network with with uh, with a real real physics flow simulation is the way to go. So yeah, my, the, my I would say that, that the, uh, okay, so this is a very good question because the uh, the problem, however, in, in the application of statistical method is that it's okay until you stay in the same condition. Because I would, I would say that's very important. I, I would say that when you look at, um, at the you know, averaging, averaging too much is also not very good because there's a lot of, of heterogeneity within the same tissue. Not to talk about uh, different parts of the, of the organ in, 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 uh, you know, in the same organ, right? but different tissues in the same organ. So there is a lot of heterogeneity in that. But you have these micro systems where the lesions occur very narrow in some parts of the tissue. And I think it's important because you may fall into an area where you are, um, you are out of the normal, the average, right? So it's, I find it difficult uh, to, uh, let's say, have a stereotype model of liver tissue that could take care of statistics with such a heterogeneity within the lobule, uh, to some extent between lobules, and, uh, and also to uh, uh, between conditions. Having said that, having said that, of course, there must be still some parameter you can afford to uh, deal with them statistically, because otherwise everything is different and it's impossible to rationalize everything. But we have, I think, to find a trade-off between these two extremes. Uh, otherwise, the technology that we have indeed has one problem, and that is very high resolution, but very small volume. Therefore, whatever we do, we have to sample in different places and make sure that we are not really having an extreme in one case, far away from the average in other cases. So therefore, indeed is a problem, and I, I don't have a, a good, at the moment, a good solution to, to, to give you really a more precise answer. Mm -hmm. I, I would have a I would have a follow up before I let Arthur Arthur ask yeah. the next question. Um, you I I I I was really impressed by the increase in pressure in the system. Uh, as as far as I, I understand, this 
this does not go into the mechanics of the tubes itself right now. You still just assume a tube that can hold basically every pressure that is available and such. So, so how how would it how is it is it sensible to include this as one point and and how would you do that? So I I, I think you're perfectly right on this thing, uh, Michel, because pressure is extremely important. In fact, we have, this is a story which I could not really for question of time, I could not explain to you, but the reason why the Balkan alikoli can be formed and stay narrow and never balloon is the fact that they have some structure that keeps them together. That the two cells make pipes that are joined by transversal structure, which are similar to the bulkheads of boats. I don't know how you say this in German, but I hope you understand what I mean. When you look at the boat, they have this transversal connection that keep the two sides together. So we think that these are very important in order to sustain pressure. Because when you have cholestasis, when you have a disease, for example, where bile flow is not normal outside of the lobule, of course, bile accumulates in the liver tissue. And therefore bile, pressure increases. And the cells do react to this pressure by having more of these connections so that the, 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 the bile flow does not fall apart and you don't have an infarction of the bicanalicular network. But in some parts of the human tissue or also the anima, uh, uh, anim, uh, uh, of the animal, if you, for example, ligate the bile duct and you create this pathological condition, you do see that some of the structure balloon. So they become spherical, they become like cysts. So indeed pressure is handled by the cell. The cell react to that and they try to buffer if there is too much pressure like under extreme pathological condition. If you have some really increases in bile flow really during the day, depending on how much you eat, et cetera, that's not a big deal. But if you have really a chronic condition, uh, or if you have really cholestasis, really no bile flux, this is really bad, bad things really for the liver. So they react I can, they, until they can, but then after you probably pass a certain threshold of what the cell can do, these things does balloon and then you will have an infarction in the, in the liver tissue. So it's entirely correct that the cells do respond to these pressure changes. Okay, thank you very much. Very impressive, thank you. Arthur. Right. Thanks very much for your talk. Uh, I was wondering if I got it correctly that uh, you were making a full uh, circle, essentially, and looping back from the 3D simulation, essentially, back to biopsies uh, in order to use this as a biomarker. If that's correct, uh, I am absolutely, by the way, a fantastic idea and a great way, an elegant way to, to bring the results of simulations into potentially clinically relevant um, way of, of, of uh, diagnosing such conditions. I'm wondering if you have any um, estimate of how stable would such approach be in a larger uh, clinical data set with potential heterogeneity coming from patient heterogeneity on, on, the, on, on one hand, and obviously uh, prep, uh, specimen preparation heterogeneity on the other hand. Do you have any estimates of... of yeah, of, so I, I don't have, of course, the, the, you put your finger into the wound and that's it, that the, the, the sorry approach about that. we have, the approach that we have is a, an approach which is limited technically, not computationally, I would say. Uh, it's really limited technically from the microscopy. This is the biggest limitation we have because with a lot of pain, we can reconstruct a, a hundred by hundred by hundred uh, micron of tissue. And therefore, as I said before, the heterogeneity on the tissue, if you take really, you are not even able to, see, you hardly are able to see a lobule Imagine to see many lobules, right? You're not having the possibility to, to have enough. Uh, so um, the, the, therefore, the, the issue is that if you take stochastically by taking really a sample in the same tissue, do you see the same thing? So from, from that point of view, the data that we verified, we do see the same thing and that's good. But to be able to change gear and then go for 
um, let's say, uh, hundreds of patients. Here we have the enormous limitation of being of having to do this reconstruction really uh, in a in such a complex way, and therefore to be able um, to uh, if you have to take a biopsy, usually they take something like uh, in the in the millimeter centimeter range. This is not a whole liver still, but even if you were was possible to do it, is from a technical point very very low throughput. And this is something where I think the future will be to find some novel method to be able to have sufficient resolution to see this in the, in the living organism. It's very, very hard to, to, uh, uh, to do this in this way because the, the, the technicalities of this are hopeless. So it's a more of a, you're entirely right. The problem is really how always representative, whenever you see a small amount of tissue, is for a, an average lobule, which is a little bit the same question that Michel asked before, how much of this is really representative for different parts of the organ in the same patients and between patients? Because eventually what we need to do is understand mechanisms. So my answer to this is that at the moment, the technology is not there, but what we can do is apply this technology to inform details also about the molecular mechanism. If we have those details, then we can come back and have other type of diagnostic uh, parameter to look at this. Because at the moment you diagnose uh, liver uh, diseases with having already fairly late uh, uh, the patient. So you don't have really much for early diagnosis. So I think that the technology is not there, but hopefully by applying this approach, we'll learn more and we'll be able to do it better. But maybe also some other imaging techniques will come to help. Absolutely, yeah. Sounds like a potential avenue for machine learning as well. Yeah, thanks very yes. much. Yeah, I, I, before, before Ulrich uh, goes on, I would actually like to add on this. And I think uh, Arthur already touched one of those things. I mean, uh, uh, w one of the problems is if you can't measure data, you somehow have to get data somewhere else. And, and one of the potentials that you could have, but of course you would need to have the statistics of variation in the, in the tissue in some sense is to create a, a synthetic data on, on those, on those connectomes so that you basically create, create not a, that you're not really taking samples, but trying to simulate samples that you can't really take and try to, to uh, uh, find out what kind of uh, functionality they create. And maybe you can see the functionality rather than the, than the, than the comparison to, to real cuts through the tissue or whatever. Is, is there anything like that going on? So but I think normally you do this with a much larger data set, right? So yeah. you, what I mean, the training data set has to be, this is, this is really uh, beginning. It's very, very hard to do it. I would agree then afterwards, if you could have hundreds of patients analyzing this way, then it becomes different. Mm -hmm. But at this stage, it's, it's hard. Mm -hmm. And you're right in principle, it's just that we are not there with experimental data. Otherwise, as I said before, the computers part, I think you will be cruising more or less. Yeah. But but the experimental data to obtain this is really the, the 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 hardest part at the moment, and we are not very satisfied with this. It's just very very demanding. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ulrich. I will have a question for you, Ulrich. But now you ask me. Oh <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a that's an interesting direction for. Uh... Yeah. No. That's a, go ahead. <laughs> Good. Um, Marino, I have a question. Or wait, before I get started with that, thank you for the wonderful talk. Also for me, this was this was really cool. Um, I was wondering about the intravital imaging part. So you already mentioned that this was uh, quite a pain to do. And one thing I was wondering about is uh, what was actually the, the duration of, of uh, imaging and how much uh, phototoxicity or any photo damage to the tissue there plays a role. Absolutely, and you have to. It's it's actually uh, it's uh, it, it's another bottleneck of the experimental uh, pipeline that we have. 
the uh, now um, the time that we were doing it, it was it was not such a good technique as we have today. So today we apply a window uh, to the animal, and that spares a lot of toxicity. Before we were sliding the liver uh, on the side of the animal and imaging with the liver almost outside, attached of course to the animal but still outside. Now we apply a window and we image uh, on the window where the liver is glued to that window. The, you can't leave it long. Uh, there are definitely, there is definitely phototoxicity. What's, what's um, not long? <laughs> long means uh, you, you image, I mean, the whole clearing that I showed you before is 40 minutes. Mm. So you see this tracer coming up in a few minutes. And by the way, if you inject something into your blood as a human, you will be a few seconds later will be in the liver and it goes very well into the liver. Otherwise, as I said, as a system, you would be, uh, it's, it's extremely efficient. So the, the, uh, the, the phototoxicity that we see, of course, depends on how long you have to illuminate and, uh, and, and in addition to keeping the animal under anesthesia, and, and, and as much as possible immobile, right? So it's sedated, etc. So there are many, many factors there. And every time you have to control, uh, because, because it's, uh, it's obvious that you see often really, if you have a right tracer, you see some modification of, of, uh, of cortical tension of the cell, they start to blab and things like this. So it's, it is indeed a, a, a factor. So you have to apply a number of control to make sure that you are not really concluding something wrong. Now, for example, one of the things that we have is that uh, I mentioned before the bile flow is flux is dominated by the osmotic effect because as the, as the bile salts go into the bicanal liquor, they attract water and therefore it's a, you increase pressure and from the pressure you, you get this bile flow. But uh, there is also another component that is membrane contractility. There is no peristalsis in the bicanal cora, but there are, we think that there is some contraction and we know because drugs, acting drugs that uh, inhibit contractility slow down bile flow. So therefore we know the contractility is also part of the component. Now, to be able to really visualize contractility means you have to really look at high frequency of labeling and, uh, and, uh, and, and small amount of, uh, of, uh, of images, you know, imaging very small parts, really, with the, with the organ, you know, moving, breathing, etc. It's very, very difficult. Of course, the more you illuminate, the more toxic effect you have. So that, unfortunately, is indeed the complication. Yeah. And... Um, so, uh, if, I, if I got it right, you, you said you're imaging using uh, two photon, right? Yes. Is there, is there any chance, I mean, it's probably like for, for reasons of like tissue penetration and so yes. on, right? Yeah. Um, is there, nevertheless, um, so I apologize if this is a stupid question, but um, is there any chance to use any of the kind of newer um, light sheet uh, geometries, like there's DISPIM and there's, uh, uh, what was the other one called? I forgot it. I will, I will yeah, figure it out the, later. At the moment, too, is the is the uh, what we see is the only approach to be able to do it. Otherwise, you will have to be very superficial. Yeah. And but you still have to go down. You, you know, is that really the problem is the penetration. Yeah. That's still yeah. A, it's not a very you know it's 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 fantastic to be able to do it, but uh, in terms of optic, is really very mm -hmm. very hard. It's not satisfactory as as to be able to to go deep enough, to long enough, not to do this toxicity is still very demanding. Yeah, okay, great, uh, thank you. <laughs> well, I was actually thinking about your cave, your yes. uh, doing <laughs> experiment in the, in the cave for something else, because we have to, um, you would ideally like in this case to look at the tissue as much as possible uh, emerge into that system and then be, and then decide where to focus on, on which sample depending on what how you see this uh, moving so in reality ideally you would like to do this experiment by applying this tracer and then deciding to go on the tissue while you are there while you're observing it 
it's actually a very interesting example of this interactive microphone. That sounds that sounds like an like an excellent use case for for some of the things we're actually developing right now. Exactly. So we should we should probably talk about this in detail. Yeah, I I think that in, you know when you have a again when you have to you don't have the luxury to image large amounts of tissue. As we said before, really, the problem we are limited by the sampling that we have. Then what you will have to do is scan it and then uh, ideally even automatically and then go and focus with higher resolution on mm -hmm. the particular subcellular almost. We talk about subcellular structure here. We talk about one micron. So obviously you have to uh, focus really in, 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 in looking at imaging at highest possible resolution um, uh, in, the, in a small area. And that means really that the approach that you had described was, was probably a necessity now. Cool. Um, let's Thank talk, you very much. Let's I'm... talk more, more detail soon. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Marina. <laughs> Dear Professor Tiria, thank you very, very much. Thank you all the speakers for today. It was really a wonderful day today, a first day of our CASUS annual workshop. You saw already while we had the really nice and interesting discussion, the program for tomorrow, 